Hi, everybody. This is Joe Weikert. I'm one of the chairs of O'Reilly's Tools of Change conference, and thrilled that you've joined us today for uh, the interesting subject of comparing and contrasting agency and wholesale models. Uh, before we jump into that, just want to let you know there's a lot going on within Tools of Change, and uh, in fact, we've built out an editorial calendar through the end of the year. June's theme has been retailing, which is why today's webcast features this discussion. Uh, we've also done a series of podcasts and radar posts available on O'Reilly.com slash TOC if you'd like to hear and, and see more about the retailing theme. Just so you know, July's theme is pricing, and we've got a great lineup of content and speakers covering uh, a whole slew of pricing-related topics. And again, you'll find more about that uh, over on O'Reilly.com slash TOC. So let's just jump right in here. Um, as I mentioned, today's webcast is comparing and contrasting the agency versus the wholesale model. I'm thrilled to uh, have Don Lin with us. Uh, Don is the president of Firebrand Associates. And Don and I have spent a lot of time over the past couple of months in particular talking about these different models. And so um, I'm going to turn it over to Don, let him kind of take it from here, and I'll be chiming in and out from time to time. So Don, welcome to the webcast. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Catherine, for the introduction. Um, I'm glad to be here today. I'm looking forward to discussing this with you, Joe, and getting questions and comments uh, from the audience along the way. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to seeing if we can stir the pot a little bit, too, along the way. I know people have strong opinions on all sides, and uh, there are some emotional and unemotional, rational responses to the topic. So uh, it should be a good discussion, and it should be a lively one. I think the best way for us to start is to make sure that we have a clear definition of what wholesale and agency model pricing is. And it's really quite simple. Um, the wholesale model is the traditional model that we've always sold books using that model. Uh, basically, the publisher provides books to a retailer at a certain discount. The retailer then sells those books to the uh, end consumer at the price that the retailer chooses to price it at. So we'll go through some numerical examples in a minute, but it's very simple, straightforward thing, and the key piece of it is that the retailer sets the price. The agency model is different, uh, and for those of you who are sticklers for legal matters, it's actually a retail price maintenance uh, model rather than a true agency model, but for our purposes, that's a distinction without a difference. But in the agency model, uh, the seller himself, in this case the publisher, sets the price, and the retailer takes a commission for selling at that price. And it's, it's fairly straightforward, but probably the best way to make sure that everyone's clear on it is to show an example. So let's go to the old traditional wholesale model first and look at a pricing example. And let's say, for instance, that Publisher X has a hard copy uh, book at that's priced at $25. And in that case, for the ebook, the vendor would pay to the publisher $12.50, which is the discounted price uh, of the highest available print edition at the time. Now, 50% discount is, is it, for example, only uh, it varies by publisher and by channel. But let's assume for these purposes that we're using a 50% discount. So the publisher's gross earnings from the sale of the book, the ebook, are 12.50, and that's a pretty good deal for him. Let's say then that the vendor is Amazon back in the day, and prices the book to the consumer at 9.99. So remember, the publisher is earning 12.50, Amazon is selling for 9.99, Amazon is paying 12.50 to the publisher. And so Amazon, or whoever the vendor might be, is losing $2.51 on the transaction. Um, there are reasons around that that we'll get to, but for now, just remember that arithmetic. And, and so this is a good example, Don, of kind of what we saw 
and have seen on Amazon for Kindle editions, right, where the the publisher is making their full discounted price of $12.50. Um, the consumer is paying less than that. So in this case, Amazon is, is losing that $2.51, and, and presumably to, to build a foundation, uh, an installed base, and so forth. That's correct. And, and, you know, to be fair, Amazon has been – Selling books below cost, their cost at uh, in in print version before ebooks came about. So this is this is really nothing new for Amazon, and their argument has always been, uh, you know, we're trying to build market share and and expand our presence in the book market. And we can talk about the merits and demerits of that shortly. Let's look at a similar pricing example under agency. So we've got the same book where the hardcover is priced at $12.50. In this case, the publisher is going to set the price for the ebook, and we've seen uh, a lot of data that suggests that beyond bestsellers, maybe they would raise the price from the $9.99 price to the $12.99 to $12.99 uh, for the for a price to the consumer. The vendor, and let's use Amazon as an example again, or Apple, uh, pays to the publisher 70% of that price. So the publisher is earning $9.09. Sorry, the vendor, the publisher is earning $3.90, which is the difference between the $12.99 and the $9.09 that the vendor is paying. And so the arithmetic here works out that the publisher, in fact, is making a little less money but so is the uh, – and the uh, retailer is, in fact, probably selling at a profit rather than a loss because he's never had to pay the, the full discounted price of the book. Everybody pretty clear on that, I assume. Uh, yep, I think so. And, and so as you go into this next slide, Don, I guess you know the thing that jumps out to me – and I, I know as part of the things that we've talked about is just how there's sort of this fallacy, I guess, if you will, of um, publishers preferring agency because it's it's a better financial model for them, whereas in reality, the scenario you just laid out shows that the publisher actually got paid more um, with wholesale than they did with, with agency, right? Sure, and that's the paradox that, that this slide discusses, and, and it really becomes a question – of what all the fuss is about. And just to step back for one second, the pros and cons uh, for, for each of these models, are really, whether you think there are pros and cons, it's one of these where you stand depends on where you sit uh, sort of situations. And uh, if, you're, if you're a reader advocate, you're happy that uh, the wholesale model is typically giving you lower prices, uh, although there is some disagreement on that in, in some of the data. Uh, the cons are that, uh, ret for, from a publisher's point of view, is that retailers control, control pricing, and that can certainly affect print sales. And the big concern is obviously the lock-in that Amazon in particular and some others are building into their ecosystem so that the hardware, the devices, and the uh, software, which are the, the books them, e books themselves, uh, are sort of a walled garden, uh, to use the phrase that's, that's, that's popular now. The pros hey, Don, from an agent. One thing, I just, I just picked up something off of Twitter here. One of the attendees was kind of wondering, um, thinking out loud, I guess, of outside the big six, how many publishers do you think are really making 50% on uh, ebook sales through Amazon that are using wholesale models? Well, they're not. Mo most of them are not making 50% uh, discount. They're making considerably less than that because their their discount is uh, is higher or lower, depending on which direction you're looking. Uh, and there's also co-op. The reason I used 50% here was really just for, for simplicity of arithmetic. But I think the, uh, the, the principles still hold, and, the, and that is that uh, you're prob the publishers in general are, are making more money, at least on selected books, uh, from the uh, wholesale model than from the agency model. And most of them will confirm that. 
And you know, so, by the way, I mean, having spoken with a lot of people about this, uh, I'm a consumer too, obviously, and and I'm all about uh, trying to pay the the lowest price and and enjoying market efficiencies and so forth. But I mean, my personal opinion on this is that it goes further than that. That that there's uh, what a lot of people have referred to as kind of predatory pricing of of uh, be, being willing to, to sell at a loss through wholesale, um, and with the potential uh, intent of maybe even um, you know market dominance and knocking out competition. How, how do you react to that? Well, I think that's that's certainly a popular um, position for people to take, particularly people in the publishers publishing community. Uh, as, as you point out, readers love Amazon because they're getting, uh, at least for now, they're getting content delivered to them at the lowest possible price, and they're getting good service and a good user experience by and large. So I, I think, again, where you stand depends on where you sit. Predatory pricing is a, a legal concept, and it is a very difficult one, as I understand it, from the attorneys that I've spoken to. And, and I should be clear, by the way, I'm not an attorney, so uh, we'll count on any attorneys in the audience to clear up any messes I make on that. Uh, but it's a very difficult thing to prove. And to be frank, we haven't seen any actions taken against Amazon from either the Department of the Justice, the states, or any consumer classes uh, with respect to it. So that suggests to me that at least nobody believes at this point uh, that there's a case to be made. Now, are they trying to dominate the market? Almost clearly so. Well, but even if they do have a monopoly, uh, unless they exercise it to the detriment of consumers, or others, uh, there's really no case for prosecuting them or, or pursuing an action against them, as I understand it. Got it. Okay. Again, just going back to the pros and cons, uh, on the agency model, publishers love it because they're controlling prices and they have made a number of claims, and we'll get to some of those, that uh, this promotes competition that agencies allowed things like Barnes & Noble and Google Books and Smashwords and other people selling books to thrive and prosper and, uh, and grow their share of market. And the evidence does bear out that, uh, that, that market share has grown, whether agency is a causal or not, uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, readers may pay higher prices, so they tend to squawk more that uh, that agency is is not really efficient for uh, from their perspective. The paradox, and, and again we mentioned this just a minute ago, is that publishers often earn more with wholesale than they do with the agency model. And as you pointed out, Joe, the real fuss uh, is about Amazon. And people's rational and irrational fears that once they become dominant, if they don't believe they're dominant already, is that they'll use their monopolistic position to damage, uh, to raise prices and dictate even harsher terms to publishers. And again, we, you know, we occasionally see Amazon being very ham-handed in their demands for additional co-op. We see them doing things on their website to, uh, that appear to be a little bit squirrely that, that hurt consumers. Uh, we see them punishing publishers off and on by turning off their buy buttons if they're having a conflict and so on. But again, uh, so far there's been no action brought against them, but it is a legitimate concern. And one of the more interesting analyses that, that I've read is from an attorney named Bob Cohn uh, in New York, and Mr. Cohn says that the whole concern that the Department of Justice and others have about a the agency model being uh, invalid under this, pr this particular set of circumstances is that we're looking at it entirely too narrowly by just looking at book prices, and that it needs to be looked at uh, as a system-wide issue, and it gets to what we were talking about earlier, Joe, 
where the device and the user experience and the um, price of the of the content come together uh, to give someone a monopolistic position that can be abused rather than strictly looking at ebook prices uh, or, or some collusion among uh, or alleged collusion among uh, publishers to get there. And if you have that URL handy, Joe, I, I would commend people to, to read that letter because I think it's a real thorough analysis. I'll, I'll warn you it's about 55 pages in length and it has a lot of case references, but it's one of the best things I've read, uh, read recently on the matter. Yeah, I'm going to push that uh, link out right now to the group chat window. Okay, and we'll... Um, I assume we'll have all these links up with the rest of the slides when when this gets up there. Right. So since we've gotten to the Department of Justice action, uh, and as I've said, there are a lot of rational and irrational arguments uh, and emotional arguments coming from both sides on the both agency and uh, and on the wholesale pricing. Let's talk a little bit about what this suit is about and what it's not about. Um, first of all, it's important to note that justice is not saying that uh, agency pricing is illegal. Uh, agency pricing is perfectly legal. It's used in a number of industries, um, and it uh, you know it, it can be used. What they are saying is that. Uh, Apple and five of the big six trade publishers in the United States colluded to use the agency model to raise prices in in the industry in an anti-competitive way. Now, there are some sort of subsets to that. And by the way, there there's a, there's quite a bit of of circumstantial evidence that the Department of Justice produced uh, in their filings that suggest that that there was indeed uh, at least the appearance of collusion in the, you know in, in the form of a number of emails between and among the various participants in the agency thing in which they discuss how to convince others to participate and how they can't do it unless everybody's in. Uh, there's even an email that says, "Delete." Be sure to double delete your emails, which are all sort of damning uh, when combined with phone conversations and phone logs and uh, meetings at restaurants and those kinds of things that that suggest, if not collusion, at least some fairly serious coordination uh, among them. But the business issues that arise from that, that came from that led the judge in this case, who was Judge Coates, to make a per se ruling on uh, on the action itself. And that per se ruling says the evidence is strong enough to suggest a presumption of guilt. Um, and he bases that on the most favored nation clause that is prohibits uh, or, or that forces all retailers to sell at the same price, and if those prices are being protected by the alleged price umbrella created by agency, then prices should naturally be, be higher. Um, so his per se ruling uh, immediately, or almost immediately, caused three of the big five who were involved, and ultimately Random House did become involved, uh, to press for a settlement with the Department of Justice and ultimately with the states as well um, to bring, try to bring the matter to an, to an end. Um, the settlements agreement produce, prohibit uh, the use well I, well I should go for a moment and just just say that Macmillan and Penguin have vowed to fight the thing in court and talk for a little bit about the terms of the settlement um, that, have, that have come forward. And what they say basically is that the publishers will have to make new agreements with Amazon and their other retailers, 
The agreements have to have staggered termination dates so that they can't get together and say, we'll all do this on date X. Uh, the publishers can consider joint ventures, so they're, they're not ruled, it's not been ruled that they can't do Bookish, for instance, which is their planned bookstore between and among themselves. And the publishers need to provide DOJ copies of the agreements with the retailers for the next five years. For two years, the publishers can't, and this is probably the most important last two, for two years the publishers can't restrict the rights of retailers to discount books. And for five years, publishers can't include most favored nation clauses in their agreements. So this pretty much takes the wind out of the sales of agency uh, for at least two years, at least among the settling uh, parties. And there, were, there was a request from Judge Coates or, or the ability uh, for interested parties to comment on the settlement before it's either approved or disapproved. Uh, that comment ended on Monday of this week, and interestingly, the judge who had initially promised a fairly quick uh, turnaround on approval or disapproval has extended uh, his review period for 30 days, and it's hard to know whether to read anything significant into that or not. Uh, the trial for the non-settlers uh, has been uh, set for June 3rd of 2013, which interestingly will be right smack in the middle of BEA, and so we should probably all set up big screen TVs at, at BEA to watch the, uh, watch the fireworks there. Yeah. Hey, hey, Don. Uh, yep. Joshua asked a really good question here that I want to ask you, and I, and I actually want to give a little bit of an answer first, and, and get your reaction to that as well as hear what you have to say outside of my answer. So, what, what he's uh, asking is, is, is the fear of publishers that the wholesale model and the, and the resulting quote-unquote predatory pricing uh, will instill an impression in the minds of the consumers of book prices being significantly lower than retail? And ultimately pushing prices lower and harming publishers. And I got I to admit, when I first read that, you know, the, the light bulb went off in my head. One of the biggest reasons why I think uh, agency is such an important option is because I worry that through um, lost leadership pricing, like the scenario you showed for wholesale, um, it's possible that publishers' content, publishers' brands, and everything that makes them up um, could be cheapened. And I feel like, in this case, it's important for publishers to be able to have a say in um, what, the, what the pricing level should be for their content so that it doesn't look like it's all fire sale pricing and, and um, you know, at the, at the whim of the retailer who is comfortable selling at a loss. I think, it's, I think, it's, I think, it's, think it's a fair question, and I think it's even more acute and, and more relevant, uh, perhaps, than O'Reilly, that uh, – for publishers who do a lot of high-priced uh, hardcover books. And this was the initial issue that led some publishers to begin windowing at a certain point. Uh, but the, the, some of the larger publishers that I've talked with said that having a, a 9.99 or cheaper ebook out there is absolutely chewing. It's already chewed up the mass merchandise copy, but it's eating away at the... Uh, at the higher volume or the higher price hardcover books as well. Uh, so I think those are those are legitimate fears. I don't know that that necessarily has any impact on the case itself uh, because if you actually look back and say, well, how did we get to this place with Amazon? To begin with, uh, publishers sort of handed Amazon the gun with which they're being being shot at this point by by working out that original set of terms. So it'll it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. But again, I have to have to keep coming back to the point that Amazon is not really a party to this action. They're sort of mentioned and talked about a lot, but they're really not not a named party uh, at all here. Uh, and if something uh, is amiss there, it's presumed that, that DOJ and others would go after them. Right. Okay. Let's go quickly, and uh, I want to leave plenty of time for questions, but 
in asking for comments, uh, uh, Judge Coates certainly uh, opened up a, a firestorm of, uh, of people who wanted to comment. And the comments are, are directed uh, to the delightfully named John Reed, spelled R-E-A-D, uh, at the Department of Justice, which I think is, is perfect. So, so what's, what are people saying about this? Uh, as I mentioned, the comment period ended on Monday. Uh, but let me list, read off just a few quotes from some of the comment letters that I've read this week, uh, as well as from a few blog posts. Uh, uh, the American Association of Publishers, or the Association of American Publishers, AAP, uh, declined to comment, and I think that's probably appropriate given the circumstances of the case. Uh, the American Booksellers Association is strongly opposed to the DOJ action and to the settlement, uh, saying that the agency model is necessary to protect bricks and mortar stores from free riding by Amazon. They say that uh, bricks and mortar stores are providing all the marketing for the books, and Amazon is swooping in cheap, with cheap books to take it away from them. Um, again, Amazon's not part of the case, but that's ABA's fundamental argument. The Authors Guild says, here's our view. In a nutshell, the proposed settlement is not in the public interest because it needlessly imperils bricks and mortar bookstores while it backs an online monopolist and discourages competition among ebook vendors. Settlement needs to be rethought and sub substantially modified. The Agents Association says the settlement is fatally flawed understanding of the economics and history of the ebook industry. A group of independent publishers last week said that Amazon will have the ability to price whole categories below cost in a way that's likely to drive out competition from other deep-pocketed ebook sellers as well as brick, bricks and mortar book sellers. And Barnes and Noble says that the proposed settlement represents an unprecedented effort by the Justice Department uh, to reject the traditional role of ending alleged collusion and become instead regulator of a nascent technology industry that it little understands. Now, the theme in all of these from people who are opposed to it tends to be, seems to be Amazon, which uh, I kind of keep coming back to the fact that Amazon's not a party to this. Uh, just a couple more comments. The Consumer Federation of America uh, supports the settlement and the action, and they said the judgment of the publisher cartel would replace the marketplace to decide retail prices if the, uh, if the, if the, if the settlement agreement were not approved. A couple of bloggers, Mike Shatskin says, I just know this industry and I know the arguments for collusion or conspiracy are mostly built on a misunderstanding of what's called evidence. Jane Litt, who has done some really outstanding legal analysis on her blog at Dear Author, uh, says that she thinks the defendants have two options here, settle now or take their slim options to the jury, where I'm convinced they will lose. And Brian O'Leary, who uh, at Magellan Media Partners blog, who's always kind of a voice of reason in these things, says that Amazon's a force to be reckoned with does not give publishers the right to improve, to collude to improve their lot. The agency business model may make good sense, but if publishers broke the law putting it in place, they still broke the law. So you can hear sort of from both the the words and the tone that uh, people feel pretty strongly about what's going on here and uh, what what should happen next. Also, and, and this is interesting, in some of the, um, the comments to the department, uh, different people have gone to some length to produce some data uh, admittedly limited data that suggests that agency pricing actually reduced or at least maintained consumer prices at the levels that uh, they were prior to agency going in effect. Uh, Simon Lipscar, who, who wrote a terrific letter for uh, the Agents Association, the AAR, says that he has seen some price increase in bestsellers, but no increase and some decrease for non-bestsellers. Um, 
Mark Coker at Smashwords done a very thorough analysis and actually, as I understand it, went to Washington to meet with DOJ uh, and says that at least at Smashwords, uh, the average price of books is declining. And Barnes & Noble, in their brief to, uh, or in their comments to the DOJ, says that consumers have enjoyed the byproducts of that competition, including lower ebook prices. Now, the data sets in each one of these, as I say, is limited, but there is some data that says what's the big deal about this is, uh, you know, the consumer has not been harmed, and we'll undoubtedly hear more about that. So where I'm do we go from here? I'm going to the links to all those here now, Don. Sorry about that. I'm going to make sure everybody okay. gets those links to the pieces you just mentioned. Yeah, and, and I do think that the, those are worth leading, reading, particularly Mr. Lipsker's uh, uh, comments from the AAR. And then, by the way, just a quick plug here, uh, Simon Lipsker is going to do a podcast with us next uh, month um, about pricing, so stay tuned for more from him. Yeah. So going forward, assuming that this is approved, and by, by the way, that, that settlement is by no means a slam dunk that it will be approved, but uh, I think the betting people at this moment are saying it probably will be. Um, the most important thing for those people who are settled are to get into compliance and, and avoid any further legal damage. Uh, I think a clear outcome from this is that Amazon's already dominant position has been strengthened further. Uh, whether this is a good thing or, or a bad thing over time remains to be seen, but most readers will benefit from probably most likely from further price declines uh, as the agency model is at least uh, eliminated in the short term. Interestingly, um, Corey Doctorow and others have said that DOJ missed the point entirely with this suit, uh, and not because of system lock-in, but because he believes that DRM is, is the bigger threat, anti-competitive threat over time. Uh, that may or may not prove to be true, but it's, it's not germane exactly to this case. And finally, the big six are going to have to figure out uh, whether they can live in a lower price environment if that's the way things are actually going to be. Uh, are they going to do that? Are they going to withhold books from Amazon? Are they going to have to find a new model uh, to deal with? And I don't think any of us knows, knows the answer to exactly how uh, that could be addressed. Um, I can also, Joe, I don't know whether you have any further questions at this point. I'm going to put up a slide for a sort of additional suggested reading, and some of these I've mentioned already. Some of them I have not, but I really would commend uh, each of these to you, and you can find them all. Joe will push the, the uh, links out, but you can find all these on the Internet, usually searching. Uh, DOJ plus agency will lead you to all manner of, of comment letters. Ken Oletta has a big story in the New Yorker last week uh, uh, that is uh, uh, sort of describes all the background mostly accurately, and some of these other blogs uh, have done a nice job of, of analyzing pros, cons, arithmetic, math, and, and other things. But uh, And I'd also commend to you Publishers Lunch for their ongoing news coverage, which has just been excellent with Michael Cater and Sarah Weinman. Yeah, I'm pushing uh, these out as you talk right now, Don, so okay. let me catch up with you here. Okay. So looking at um, just both models, Side by side, Don. I mean, if you're if you're starting a new publishing house, is there what, what are the reasons why you would lean more towards one than the other? Let's say. Well, first of all, you assume that I would start a new publishing house in this <laughs> environment, which is uh, you know a question in and of itself. But I I think at this moment, uh, again, assuming that the that the uh, settlement is going to be approved, your choice is going to be to figure out a way, or your your real option is going to be a way, be to figure out a way 
to make money using wholesale. And, and right now, again, given the terms that uh, that Amazon's operating under, you can make some, and in some cases more money with wholesale uh, than you can with agencies. So I would lean in that direction heavily in the short run while scrambling to figure out ways to get my uh, my costs down and make my business model fit into a lower price environment, which I think we're headed toward under almost any circumstances. And it's not that uh, this is without precedent. I, there are lots of digital-only uh, genre imprints out there and other imprints coming forward that appear to be at least making money um, uh, using the wholesale model or selling directly themselves. But I think, uh, as O'Reilly well knows, that uh, that digital uh, or that direct sales is is an important part of this game. Yeah, it's funny you bring that up. I don't know if you've been watching the group chat window, but that was a, a separate uh, sort of vein of thought here that, that's been going back and forth and uh, without getting too far off the beaten path of agencies uh, versus wholesale models. Um, you know, I, I couldn't agree more that uh, a direct channel is so important these days. And, and it's not just because you're capturing 100% of the transaction, but rather you're learning so much from your customers exactly. to build new products that, that meet their needs, right? And, and then, you know, without sort of tooting our horn, horn too much here, but, I mean, we're not just about books at O'Reilly. So we can expose our customers on the book side to conferences we do and other products and services. So, sure. Um, you know, you're right. I mean, it's important to figure out which of these models is, is, is best for your organization. But I'm amazed at how many um, publishers of all sizes are still leaving the direct model kind of on the table. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, again, it will be interesting to see if, if Bookish uh, ever makes it out of the gates or if, uh, if individual publishers can figure out ways to do, to sell direct as, as you also know it it's not you don't just one day say we're selling direct and open up the store and off you go it requires uh, a lot of a lot of back end processes it requires excellent customer service to make sure that that the user experience is as good as the content you're selling well that and and you know when i brought that up in the group chat window a number of people sort of called me out and said well you know, it's not that easy, right? And I said, absolutely, you're, you're totally right. You can't just throw a shingle out there and expect people to come buy from you. And I think O'Reilly certainly is the only one that's done done well here with this. There are others. Um, yep. But I think one of the common threads between the successful ones is that they understand their community and they're working hard to, to work with that community as opposed to just selling products to them. Exactly. So, um, you know, we, we have a pretty good-sized staff within O'Reilly that is focused on on exactly that. So, and, and I'm sure that's true with the other successful direct uh, sales publishers out there. Let me uh, throw a few of these questions that have queued up on sure. us towards the end here, Don. So, first one uh, from Marianne uh, asks: So, Amazon likes wholesale, Apple likes ag agency. What about Barnes and Noble or Google? Uh, Barnes and Noble has been in strong support of agency. Uh, from the get-go, they argue that it's allowed them to to thrive and prosper, uh, and, and but mainly they are making the subtle argument that it's uh, it has protected them from having to compete with Amazon strictly on a price basis. Uh, I don't know what Google's position is on this. I just have not come across it anywhere. They've been silent for the most part. Yeah, and I was under the impression that Google would allow either models. I don't know if there's a preference there or not. That's my that's my instinct too. But I, I again, somebody would have to fact check me on that. Yeah. Okay. So next up, Matthew uh, is just asking: Was any publisher besides the big six able to go agency with Amazon? Well, you know, it, Joe, I you know, I've I've heard whispers about this off and on ever since it started, but. At least officially, nobody but Big Six has has been on it. Now, again, as I pointed out, Smashwords has used agency pricing in in their uh, uh, on their website and in their business. But to my knowledge, nobody, at least officially, uh, is is a, using agency pricing except the Big Six. But Smashwords is is uh, they get distributed by Amazon as well, right? 
Yeah, uh, through a special program at Amazon. Yeah, they're not. Uh, they're not just, as I understand it, at least they're not just another customer in in uh, right, okay. in the Amazon store. Or event. okay. Uh, next next question we've got from uh, Joshua here. In your opinion, if publishers have to adapt to the new world of publishing with lower prices for books, are they going to have to have significant reductions in overhead? And by the way, before you jump into that, that may be sort of follow up from something I mentioned before of how um, I feel that publishers can't complain too much about falling or, or the pressure, downward pressure on prices, mostly because I feel like all we've done up to now is, is largely quick and dirty conversions of, of print to e without a lot of the benefits of the print book. So, for example, if I buy an ebook, most in most cases I'm not able to just give it to you and let you give it to somebody else when you're done and so forth. So. How could we possibly expect to, to charge as much, if not more, um, for the e-version of, of this print book when it's so limited? So um, I think what, what Joshua was saying, and, and this is another part of a, a thread that was on the group chat window where somebody pointed out that um, you know, we need to start looking at e-books uh, not as just derivative works of print and, and the financials in particular there. And I said that, um, yeah, we've got to fully load these P&Ls for e-books. Not just let them ride the coattail of the print version. So, I think that's where where Joshua's question is coming from here. Of, of you know, we're going to have to come up with ways to significantly reduce overhead. My reaction to that is yes, um, and certainly as the world exists today, I think we're going to be faced with that. Um, but I but I do think that down the road, as we create richer content, there's going to be a possibility there for content creators to charge a bit more for it. Um, just because of that richness, especially if it's something that you can't really mimic in a in a print product. So I, I think that's that? that's exactly right, Joe. And, and both of those points were were the ones that that I would have made. Uh, clearly, we've got to figure out a way to continue to take costs out of out of the business model. And I don't think you necessarily do that by just chopping off. Uh, uh, you know, more copy editors or, or editors or whatever. It's got to be done through workflow and, and efficiencies in the way the books themselves are actually produced. But but I, I do think that, you know, we're not entitled to a certain price for our books. We've got to demonstrate value uh, to reach that price. And, and as you point out, we've done some things to shoot ourselves in the foot uh, with uh, – some of the some of the DRM issues, some of the inabilities to lend books or share books, and the other things you pointed out uh, that have have limited the value of it, and we need to figure out ways. Some of them are pretty clear. Some of them we're going to have to uh, grab out of the sky someplace to to make these books as valuable, if not more valuable, than uh, than their print counterparts. Right. Right. Okay. Next question is from uh, Sebastian. Um, asking what about the role of most favored nation uh, in the debate it seems to me that uh, it seems to me to be incompatible to have reseller agreements and agency agreements with most favored nation clauses um, at least it would be a problem for publishers isn't it and you know I, I don't know how you feel about this Don but I, I just feel like the most favored nation piece of this was part of the smoking gun that the DOJ went after and was probably a crazy uh, element to have in, in agency it, it it really is. It uh, it basically it eliminates pricing as a form of competition between retailers because virtually every retailer will, will have the most favored nation clause in his or her contract in its contract, and every vendor will insist on on having it uh, uh, in there. So. If on a Tuesday Amazon were to reduce the price, and they do this from time to time to a dollar ninety nine, right? You know, we have a dollar ninety nine book day, and if you check on those days, Barnes and Noble matches that dollar ninety nine price. So there is no price competition with Most Favored Nation, and I, I do agree with you that 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 is a, a real kind of a, a, a smoking gun or, or something stinky left on the table that uh, that raises some questions. Yeah, okay. Next we have from Julie saying, uh, he said that in the agency model, publishers set the price, but in our experience, the retailers were dictating the prices at which we could sell our content. Has any publisher truly been able to set prices in the agency model? 
Well, my understanding is that the prices are set in just, again, as you would with your real estate broker. You have, uh, you have conversation with, with your agent about what you think the price of your house should be listed at and ultimately sold at. Uh, but there is at least a floor below which you will not sell, and there is a... Uh, the ability to set the price and hold it at that price. I don't believe under true agency, and I don't believe under the experience that we've had so far, uh, that uh, that Amazon or the other vendors have been setting prices. Now, I guess one exception to that, though, would be in, in these proposed settlement terms, what um, the DOJ has offered up here is that a retailer can go ahead and let the uh, retailer I, I'm sorry, the DOJ has said that a retailer can forego their cut. So in other words, if it's a 70-30 right. split, that that retailer could discount to the end consumer as much as that 30%, um, whereas other agency um, retailers may decide that they don't want to match that price. So in that case, there could be some price differential, right? That's right. That's right. Now, my instinct is that Retailers will match each other anyway because once somebody's down there, uh, they're going to get all the traffic and the sales unless uh, unless you match. But uh, it's a possibility, sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Sean asks, uh, why, why would a new publisher want to engage either wholesale or agency as the dominant model? Aren't those legacy channels uh, just temporary add-ons for new publishers who would naturally go direct? Which I guess is kind of a loaded question, right? Yeah. Well, it, it, you know, it's it's a little bit of a of a willy sudden. Why do you rob a bank? Because that's where the money is. Uh, why do you sell with either agency or wholesale through the major retailers? It's because that's where the customers are at this point. Um, there are experiments with people going strictly direct, and and some of them, uh, or at least primarily direct, and there have been some of them like in the romance category that have been extremely successful doing that. Uh, there are also others in, that are not in genre fiction, like or books, who have tried to set up uh, distribution models where they're going strictly direct. And it's just tough to get traction right now because there's so many books out there. And if you're not at a place where the traffic is coming and, frankly, paying the co-op to make your your book at least somewhat visible. It's very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult to start up uh, and work without using one of these models, unless you're. Yeah, I'm glad them. you. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the uh, the whole books example there because um, I actually did a, an interview um, probably I guess about uh, a few weeks ago now um, with with uh, one of their co-founders, uh, John Oakes, and and. He had, I think, some really good insights because, like you said, they, they were starting from scratch and didn't have um, sort of that visibility, let's say, that an existing publisher might have to build a platform around. And, you know, one of the, one of the comments back to this last question about uh, wouldn't new publishers just go direct rather than um, using a legacy model, uh, somebody had mentioned, well, how are you going to get discovered and how are you going to get onto the Kindle and so forth? And certainly there are ways around that. But I think I think John and his company have done a pretty good job of, of trying to solve that problem. So I would encourage folks to go dig up that uh, that interview we did and, and listen to what he had to say. Right, and I should disclose I'm an investor and director of Or Books, so I'm I'm enthusiastic okay. about what they're doing. Too. Okay, well I didn't know that till now. Yeah. So hopefully yeah. folks don't feel like that was a paid plug by me. No, it was. I, I, <laughs> we, I don't I don't think you knew that. Yeah. No, that is new to me. So okay. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions uh, in the chat window there. Um, so I, let me just say, folks, thanks so much for uh, tuning in today. Hopefully this was um, helpful as, as you look at the, the comparisons between these two models. And um, if, if you've got any follow-up questions after we hang up here, feel free to email them to me. Um, I'll make sure they get to Don or just you know get them to somebody on the O'Reilly team, and, and we'll get them answered out there. So, Don, thanks uh, so much. You did a terrific job today. Uh, thanks for all the research you've done on this and for um, you know, making this so understandable for the rest of us. Thank you, and I am uh, happier than ever that I'm not an attorney at this point. <laughs> 
All righty. Thanks again, and thank you, everybody. Good. Take Thanks care. to everybody for listening, and at me on Twitter if you would like to ask something further. Oh, thanks. Thank you both, Joe and Don. That was a great discussion. And um, someone's asking, Jared's asking, will this be recorded? Yes, we have recorded it, and we'll send everyone an email to the recording as soon as we have that edited. That will probably be next week. We're a little shorthanded this week, so we'll get that out to you. And um, as Joe said, if you continue to have questions or want to keep the discussion going, feel free to use the hashtag and post on Twitter. It's T O C C O N. Uh, TOC Con, and um, Joe always watches that, so he'll get right back to you. And that's all I have to say today. Just thank you for making this a good discussion. Hope you'll join us again soon. That concludes our webcast. Goodbye.